Thank you very much. Good morning. I would like to thank the organi organizer. And I would, like to art to the, I would like to speak to the art of the oncologist. I see that most of the oncologists don't trust in radiotherapy. They are going away. But I will not speak a lot of radiotherapy. We will speak to two oncolo about oncology. OK, uh, next. Oh. Now, to understand what is the role of radiotherapy as well, I think also chemotherapy, we have to, to speak about the frame of the knowledge-based oncology. Does it mean in the modern state situation, we have to support clinical decision? And to support clinical decision, we have to uh, melt together from one side the multidimensional scientific evidences, the different homics that we have in biology, imaging, clinic data, with a patient perspective and with ethic values, because ethics address affordability, address also an impact, accessibility to the healthcare. So all this dimension represent what we call knowledge, and knowledge are behind the clinical decision. I would like to see what is the contribution that the next step in radiotherapy could have impact in the individualization of treatment as well in the adaptive treatment and which kind of support we have to model the, to, to model the clinical decision in the frame of the knowledge-based oncology. Individualization, what is the next for radiotherapy in the individualization? We know very well that uh, we are strongly based on imaging. We listen that we are interested in the position of the tumor, respect the anal canal, what is the status of the mesorectum, uh, EMV, uh, we have seen, and the relationship with the mesorectal fascia, what happening outside the mesorectal fascia. Everything is imaging-based. Okay. But if we want to individualize as oncologists, and this is also a challenge as to understand what, we, what will affect our clinical decision quite soon, is that we have to think that elderly will become a large majority of patients that we will see. This is projection, but what is most important, 2020, every day in Europe, 160 patients will be diagnosed by rectal cancer with more than 75 years. And so what is the next for radiotherapy there? As was mentioned before from uh, Professor Austerman, for them, there is obviously a challenge to receive surgery. You see in this uh, German data, in this uh, Dutch data, that patients up with more than 75 years had from 13 to 28% of risk of to, die, to die for surgical procedure in the six months after death. So they are really challenging. And radiation therapy start a long story here because in the 70, they start to organ preservation, putting in the uh, anal canal a tube where X-rays came, were delivered on the tumor, namely with small tumor. But nowadays, the new techniques, image guided, could provide to insert a probe in the rectal uh, and then to deliver a dose very highly precisely addressed on the tumor. And this is a practice that in, uh, in some centers in the world, namely in the North America and in the McGill, but also in Europe. And this uh, opportunity you see is applied for bigger tumor. And the outcome that are available in the small, cent in small series are quite promising. And so we support the idea to have this tool for aged patient or to promote better local response of the tumor in a multidisciplinary setting. We promote uh, uh, some uh, support for the discussion in multidisciplinary setting, 32 questions, 32 answers, and some meetings to address organ preservation and in the individualized approach for rectal cancer, radiotherapy have as, as a next, the brachytherapy tools to support some patients, some situation where there is the need to have local control of the tumor uh, when other treatment modalities are not so easy to apply. For adaptive, adaptive is quite known that we have tumor response after treatment uh, preoperative treatment, and this challenge the, the following choice. Are we to do surgery? Are we to wait? Uh, are we to do local excision? Are we to do brachytherapy? And this adaptive choice is taking into account some different variables. 
And these variables we have seen before, just before from uh, David Cunningham, that uh, he managed a choice on five variables. Artists, and then he said, okay, we are working with PET-CT, and so we will add some other variable. And the process that is behind is really the next for the oncology knowledge minds. And means uh, that we try to do some exercise. We put together many variables, not only PET, CT variables, or MRI variables. We manage by some mathematical tools, just, and just to have here a the supporting tool for the decision. And we got the nomograms. You know, the nomograms is a, a decision tool. The width of the bar are related to the weight of the individual variable. But in this first experience, we saw that the, what the pathological, the uh, biological probe, the finger, could detect the length of the tumor as an impact wider, a higher, a bigger than the data from, uh, from PET CT. So multiple variables that we are managed all together can support some clinical choice better than what we thought sometime evaluating only few variables. This is the background for two projects that I, won't, I am involved in, but I want to share because the background I think that can help you to understand what is the next, next in radiation oncology and in oncology. Why not to do it imaging analysis before, along the treatment? So during the treatment modality, why? Because we tested it. We also put together uh, clinical variables, not yet biological variables, but clinical variables, imaging variables, and we, go to, we select which of them are more predictive after two weeks of treatment of one clinical outcome, in this case PCR, and then we saw that in that moment we can have some decision tool that is a little bit more supportive in the, in the choice of the treatment than only some few variables analyzed it independently and managed by the discussion in the tumor boards. And so uh, we did the second analysis there of the large databases that we have from randomized trial to see if PCR is predictive more than, uh, better than disease-free survival at two years. Because if we predict uh, the decision based on one outcome that is not related to a reliable marker, I could have some problems thereafter. So what did we did? We put in, the, in this draw the relationship from the, rate, the incidence of distant metastasis versus the incidence of local recurrence. And we have in this first part of the draw that in the first two years there is a group of patients who had an early presentation of metastasis, much more than local, rec local recurrence. These are 3,200 patients. They are in the randomized trial. This was a group of very adverse uh, behavior patients, so the ugly patient. Then we have another group of patients that go slowly to recur, also very late. So the recurrent patients have two different behaviors, but the cutoff is after two years. So we made an analysis comparing these two endpoints, PCR versus two-year disease-free. And we saw very clearly that the survival of the patient with PCR is not so predictive when uh, then they have an early local recurrence. Because still we have patients with an early local recurrence, we see the blue line, in, with an early low, mid distant recurrence so the, in the blue line, so they recurred in some way, even they were PCR. Instead, the patient that and they have a very bad survival compared patients that had no PCR, this patient C had no PCR, but they didn't recur in the first two years. So the message, the message for the uh, people like U UK colleagues that are testing a systemic treatment to control uh, the tumor because it's a high metastatic rate, testing PCR, could be not so really strongly evidence-based because PCR is not so strong to predict final survival. It predicts a good group of patients that, when, that still have a good survival, but not all PCR have good survival because part of them are still with a part of the ugly patient. So at the end, what means all these, all these uh, events? 
it is considered data that we collect, that we can consider that we have a, a group of patients with good chance of survival. For them, the question is if they can avoid surgery or if they can avoid radiotherapy and chemo, not to overtreat. We have bad patients where combined treatment could be beneficial, and some patients that we don't know exactly what is the best treatment for them. How it could be reflected in an adaptive era in a, with nomograms to take some decision? We can consider that after two weeks, we can repeat some exams, and there to look at what is the disease-free probability by this decision-supportive tool. For the adverse patients, we can go there for intensification. We can put here upfront chemotherapy, why not between the radiotherapy and surgery, or to do the same disease-free prediction model after chemotherapy and to, to put it before the following treatment. But just to test very early what is the prediction for disease-free at two years. And then, if after the, if for the patient who are favorable, favorable disease-free, to complete the treatment, and then to look what is the prediction of PCR. And for who is with high prediction of PCR, going in for techniques that are organ saving, and for patients who are not with the frame of prediction of high PCR, for them, exploit looking what it could be helpful to do, may, why not afterwards. So, in the frame of the adaptive era, combining different omics, putting reliable endpoints, and sharing it, and using this prediction model along the treatment could be very important. And in radiotherapy work, we are looking to do that. Why? Because uh, we have an, an advantage, let me say because our radiation therapy modality works on a computerized base. Nowadays, in our computers, we have not only the dose distribution of one patient, but more and more, our treatment console are on platforms that are shared in thousands of centers with an easy connectivity between them. So the idea to have large databases that support the decision that we are behind the dose distribution is becoming really possible. So this project that we want, what, want to help the radiation oncologist that looking at the dose distribution to take care of the data there are in the packs, in the clinical charts, the data, individual data, the data there are in the archives that are already in the same databases, and the data they are in their archives or other centers, they have the same platform. Just to be practical, if I looked at those distribution, when I said this is good, I do it and I accept the prediction of to be successful. I could be successful up for, with this dose distribution to cure the patient in 80% of the cases integrated with surgery and so on. But if I start to put together the data from the in many other variables that I have in the patient and the, from the similar patient in my archives, maybe that the choice of the dose distribution that I do could be optimized. And which other data we have? This is what I mentioned before. Sometimes we use, we are rough as a clinician, we use very few data because these are the data that are available. But more and more, there is the possibility to look at imaging with a different perspective. This uh, tumor shape could have a different impact if, if we look at this other shape, at this other shape again. So it means that there is some correspondence with data that we, are, we can get from imaging in an automatic way, and as well for the surface to get numbers that we can put in these large databases to get, uh, this is uh, another number that is fractalis number, just to look at the shape of the tumor and put this number there as well for the taxitor, the tumor. It's possible nowadays to find the signature of by MRI or what is the taxitor, put this signature in the database, integrate it with a dose distribution, and so in this way to do a prediction of what is happening. This is for the spot. If we can consider this granulation can have some impact also in the hotspot of PET-CT or the diffusion high intensity to get a macro array 
that is supporting the clinical decision where the data are from epidemiology, imaging, biology, and response. This is something that is possible to afford, also considering the large number of centers that have in radiation oncology, same support and platform, to optimize the choices. So this is the, what is the next. The next is that the radiation oncology could arrive to offer to the oncologic community a more decision supportive tool based on the fact that many of the data that we handle are already in the platforms that can help us to be more accurate in the prediction of our decision. So this is the background of what is next. We can be individualized because we can take care of the age. We can take care of the decision system by mathematical models. And what we want to support is the integration with all other the disciplines to be effective, to satisfy the patient perspective as well the affordability of the cure at the multidimensional of the knowledge. I have to acknowledge the PhD of groups that in Roma and in the, in the Mastro Clinic work in the two projects. Thank you very much for your attention.